On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, hello everyone. I want to talk to you today about how to overcome the storms of life. You know, I perceive that some of you watching this Bible study today need to adjust how you respond to the challenges that you face in life. Why? Well, because we all go through challenges. It's a part of being human. If you are a child of God, you have a godly advantage. And that's the important thing. Now, challenges should not phase you. They shouldn't dampen your spirit or cause you to turn back from following Jesus. But many Christians do that because they don't understand how to deal with their challenges. Now, the disciples of Jesus went through all kinds of persecution. They went through imprisonment and even stoning but they stayed faithful to the very end. In other words, they overcame the storms that they had in their lives, and so can we. So I want to start today by reminding you that every time you read about Jesus in the scriptures, you are reading about yourself. Yes, you heard me right. Every time you read about Jesus in the scriptures, you are essentially reading about yourself. Why? Well, because Jesus came to show us how to live the kingdom life here on earth. He came to show us how to think, how to talk. He came to show us how to act. He came to show us how to relate with one another. And Jesus, for that reason, is our perfect prototype. He is our example. He is the template that we are called to pattern our lives after. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says this about Jesus. It says, Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Yes, he's the firstborn over all creation. He was the first man to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him fully. If you remember in the Old Testament, the believers there, they were inspired and helped by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit did not dwell in them like he dwells in us today. Jesus was the first man to have the Holy Spirit in him without measure, without limitations, the Bible says. John chapter 3 verse 34 says it this way. It says, it says, God gave Jesus the Holy Spirit without measure, or if you like, without limitations. Wow. So Jesus is our prototype. He is our example. He exemplifies everything that a Christian is supposed to have and is supposed to be. Whether that's faith, whether it's patience, whether it's a boldness or authority, whatever it is, he is our prototype. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says, Christ left us an example that we should follow in his steps. So every time you read about Jesus in the scriptures, you are reading about how you are supposed to function. He is the standard and we take our cues from him. Now, if you don't know this, if you don't know this truth, you will walk around like everyone else. You'll walk around defeated, you'll walk around broken, you walk around uh, timid and fearful and, and, and victimized by the enemy. But if you are conscious of it, if you internalize it and remind yourself of it every day, you will not be a victim of life or circumstances. In fact, you will be a victor. Amen? Now, in our text scripture, Jesus shows us how to deal with the storms that confront us in life. Whether those storms are storms in our relationships, in our business, in our career, or in our finances. There is a way to rise above the storms that come against us. There is a way to rise above the setbacks and the stumbling blocks of life. And, and the, the, you know, when we look around today, there's a lot of bad news. Whether it's about the economy or about the security of our nation, there's a lot of bad news out there. And things appear to be really bad. Now, these are called the storms. These are the storms of life. 
and they will come. We can't actually avoid them. They will come. But if we build our spiritual house on the rock of ages, if we build our spiritual house on the ancient of days, if we, if we build on Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, when all is said and done, we will be left standing. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So if you're experiencing a storm in your life today, God had you in mind when he led me to prepare this message. Don't panic. Just do what Jesus did when he was in a storm of his own. Now, the question is, what did Jesus do? Well, let's start with some context. Jesus had been uh, teaching. He'd been challenging the people. He'd been healing the crowd. And then he decided that he was going to go to the other side of the lake to get some more work done there. Now, the first thing Jesus did was to declare where he was going before he set out on that journey. Uh, now, that's how faith works, really. Jesus said this. He said, let's cross over to the other side. N not let's go to the middle of the sea and drown, but let's cross over to the other side. Which brings me to my first life lesson. And that's this. Find out what God's will for your life is and declare it boldly before anything ever happens. I'll say that again. Find out what God's will for your life is and declare it boldly before you see it happen, before it comes to pass. Why? Because faith calls things that are not as though they are. Then those things become reality. Amen? As a Christian, you must learn to declare your expectation boldly. Why? Firstly, because your words are powerful. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says it this way. It says, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Jesus said, you will have whatever you say, whether it's positive or negative. Because you see, words are powerful. Words are creative. Words formed our world and keep our world functioning. If you remember in Genesis chapter 1, God spoke words and all of creation as we know it exploded into existence. Hallelujah. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3, the Bible says, By faith we understand that the walls were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of things that are visible. So this world was made by words. Hallelujah. Secondly, words are spiritual messengers that carry your desires into the presence of God. And that's why Jesus taught us to speak to God when we pray. He said, when you pray, say our Father in heaven. Say your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus didn't ask us to think our prayers or to meditate our prayers. He said, speak your prayers. If you look at Daniel chapter 10, when Daniel was praying and fasting, an angel was sent to answer his prayers. And this is what the angel said to him in verse, um, verse 12 of Daniel chapter 10. The angel said, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come because of your words. Hallelujah. I have come because of your words. Daniel's words summoned an angel. Wow. Hallelujah. But thirdly, words construct an invisible bridge to your future or to your destination. Words determine your destiny. They, you know, you, you are where you are today because of what you said yesterday. For example, I was thinking the other day, when I was 18, I said to myself, I'm going to be an engineer. And guess what? At age 24, I became an engineer. When I was 26, I confessed that I would be a minister of the gospel. And guess what? By the time I was 29, I had become an official minister of the gospel. In 2002, when we were in our previous building, I said, we're going to get a bigger building. Three years later, we got our present building. What's my point? My point is that words have a way of transporting you to your destiny. Can I get an amen from someone? Amen? Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 2 says, You are snared by the words of your mouth. The, words, the word snare there means to be trapped, 
Solomon is telling us that words can trap us. They can trap us positively or they can trap us negatively. Words can trap you in poverty or they can trap you in prosperity. They can trap you in sickness or in health. They can trap you in your past or they can trap you in your future. So learn to speak words that would keep you in the blessings of God, that would trap you, as it were, in the blessings of God. Speak words that would help to frame the kind of future that you want. Speak words that would take you where you want to go in life. Because whether you know it or not, you have ministering spirits called angels who are waiting to hear your instructions. Yes, your angels are waiting to get their assignment from you. And that only happens when they hear you declare the word of the Lord. So instead of saying, I don't know what to expect, or I'm confused, or I'm just so unlucky, uh, things fall apart whenever it's my turn, that, those are negative words. Instead of saying that, say, I know what to expect. I, 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 I expect favor. I expect the peace of God. I expect to succeed in all my endeavors. I expect the blessings of God. That's what you should say. Say everything is working together for my good because God said so. That's what you should say. Say God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Hallelujah. Say, I trust God and refuse to lean on my own understanding. Hallelujah. And say things like, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. In other words, say what God says about you, not what you feel like saying, uh, and not what the circumstances, circumstances around you are dictating. Remember that faith calls things that are not as if they are. And then those things which did not exist eventually become a reality. And they become your reality if you speak the right words. You know, even secular motivational speakers understand this spiritual principle. I mean, they call it positive affirmation or confessions. But guess what? They got it from the Bible. They, they got it from Jesus. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus said this. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, be moved from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for you. In short, Jesus said, if you say, you will see. I like that. If you say, you will see. So watch what you say. Stop saying things like, my, my foot are killing me, or my foot is killing me, or, or why am I so stupid, or, or silly me. You know, stop saying things like, I'm afraid, or I'm, un I'm so unlucky. Nothing seems to work for me. Stop demeaning yourself, because the living God doesn't see you like that. God calls you blessed. God calls you accepted. He calls you rich and highly favored. Amen. That's what God calls you. He calls you his son or his daughter. And he calls you the apple of his eyes. Wow. So instead of saying what your pessimistic teacher or your negative friends said about you, only say what God says about you. So the first lesson is Jesus declared where he was going before he got there. Find out what God says his will for your life is and declare it boldly. That's what the woman with the issue of blood did. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be well. And that's exactly what happened to her. She said it and she saw it. Well, not long after Jesus got into the boat in our story, a deadly storm arose. Which brings me to my second life lesson. As soon as you decide to make progress in your life, Satan will try to stop you. Let me say that again. As soon as you decide to make progress in your life, Satan will try to stop you. That's his job. He will try to discourage you. He, he will try to distract you. He will try to put barriers and roadblocks and, uh, in, your, in front of you. But don't be surprised. That's his job. He is the accuser of God's people. The Bible says, our enemy goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. In other words, who he can discourage who, or who he can tear apart. So understand 
that on the way to your destination, you will be attacked. Your faith in God's word will be tested. Every Christian will go through challenges, but these challenges are there to make you stronger. Hallelujah. And that's why in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, the Bible says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though some strange things were happening to you. But rejoice in so much as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Soon after Jesus said, let's cross over to the other side, you know what happened? A deadly storm arose and the disciples were afraid. They, they, were, they actually thought they were going to perish. Now, here's, a, here's what I want you to do. I want you to understand that Satan cannot kill you because your life is in God's hands. He'll try to scare you, he'll, he'll try to make you afraid, and he'll try to paralyze you with fear. That's why he sends storms. It's to paralyze you with fear. Because he knows that fear is the opposite of faith. And if you're full of fear, it will rob you of faith. If you have no faith, you can't please God. You can't even begin to please God. So I feel like saying to someone watching this, Satan is a bully. He may make a lot of noise, but he has no teeth to bite you with. So don't be afraid. Jesus is in your boat. Amen. The disciples were surprised and fearful, but Jesus wasn't because he knew that the storm was just a distraction to make the disciples fearful. On the other hand, Jesus had enough faith in what he had declared that he went to sleep instead of worrying, instead of being anxious or second guessing himself, he just took a nap. Which brings me to my third life lesson. After declaring your destination, learn to rest in the faithfulness of God. Rest in the character and integrity of God. Learn to rest in the love of God for you. Because you see, God's got your back. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says this. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God says, don't be anxious about anything because anxiety doesn't change anything. It's a futile exercise. And secondly, anxiety is dishonoring and disrespectful to God. It means we don't trust him and we don't believe his word. But thirdly, anxiety is harmful to our own health and well-being. Anxiety causes high blood pressure. It causes depression and stress and addiction to antidepressants and all kinds of health problems. So if you want to learn, uh, if you want to learn how harmful anxiety is, I want to suggest that you read my book titled Stress No More. You'll get some information there that will help you. So when you believe you have discovered the will of God for your life and have committed it to God in prayer, learn to chill, learn to rest, and God will work it out for you. Now, Jesus knew that there was a storm brewing, but he went to sleep. He rested in God. And you can do that too. When you know that God's got your back, he's got you in the palm of his hands, the Bible says. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, the disciples went to wake him up and they asked him this question. They said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? That's what they said. Do you not care we're perishing? Which brings me to my fourth life lesson. Just because God is quiet during the storm doesn't mean that he has forgotten you or left you on your own. No, 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 no. You are not out of the will of God just because God seems to be silent. Remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were in the fire, but Jesus was there with them. What about the story of Daniel? He was in the lion's den, <laughs> but God sent his angels to protect him from the lions. In the same way, God is with us wherever we go. Amen. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15, God said this. He said, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely 
they may forget, yet I will not forget you. I like that. God says he will not forget us. See, sometimes God is quietly waiting to see how you would handle the storms. Well, don't behave like the disciples. Never accuse God of not caring because he cares more than you would ever know on this side of heaven. That's why Jesus rebuked the disciples in verse 40. He said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Jesus was testing their faith. He was testing to see if they would trust his word. And they failed. They failed the test. But you and I do not need to fail that test because we now have the answers. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, finally, Jesus neutralized the storm by speaking directly to it. He said, peace, be still. Which brings me to my fifth life lesson. And that's this, that the challenges you face will keep raging until you learn to speak to it. <laughs> here, here is a lesson you must never forget. Challenges and problems have ears. I'll say that again. Challenges and problems have ears and they respond to words spoken with authority. Crying wouldn't help. Worrying would not help. Posting on Instagram will not change anything. But speaking the word of God to the situation will put a stop to it. Amen? It will put a stop to it. And you have to learn to address every situation with faith-filled words. I'll say that again. You have to learn to address every situation with faith-filled words. God's words. Because you see, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us, that the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Matthew chapter 24 verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. That means when you are battling sickness in your body, you must learn to say what God says about the issue. You must learn to say, by his stripes, I am healed. Sickness has no place in my body because my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you're feeling confused, you must reject confusion and declare what God says. What does God say? He, he says, I, I don't, he says he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. When you're broke, you must learn to confess what God says. What does God say? He says he will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. Hallelujah. Not according to your economy or according to your job, but according to his riches. Hallelujah. So you must be quick to say what the Lord says. He says he is your shepherd. You shall not lack any good thing. That's what God says about the issue. And here's the biggest secret of all. You must keep saying what God has said for however long it takes whether it takes uh, three hours or three days or three weeks or three months or even three years, maybe even three decades, you keep saying what God has said. You see, everything Jesus did was to illustrate to us what we too can do. And that's why the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. We are not just going to be like Jesus when we get to heaven. We are already like him now in this world. We have the potential to function on earth as Jesus functioned. Amen. When he spoke to the storm, he was telling us that we too can speak to our problems and our challenges. We can put a stop to our storms the way he put a stop to his. So I want you to believe that because believing is seen in the kingdom of God. What you believe is what will happen for you, whether positive or negative. When you believe the word of God, it saved you. It redeemed you. It transformed you into a child of God. But if you believe the lies of the enemy, what would it do? It defeats you. It sabotages your progress in life. And that's not your portion in Jesus' name. God plans for you are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. That's what Jeremiah 29 11 says. Believe it and you will see it. I can say that with confidence because you see, I've watched God do that for the last 45 years. 
and he is no respecter of persons. So, in conclusion, when you find yourself in a storm, here are five things that would help you to overcome that situation. Number one, find out what God's will for your life is and declare it boldly before anything ever happens. Because you see, faith calls things that are not as though they are. And when they do, they become reality. Number two, as soon as you decide to make progress in your life, Satan will try to stop you. Well, when that happens, don't be surprised. Don't allow him to poison you with fear because everyone who steps out for God gets attacked. Number three, after declaring your destination, learn to rest in the faithfulness of God. Learn to rest in his integrity, in his character, and in his track record because the Bible says he is mighty to save. Number four, just because God is quiet doesn't mean that he has forsaken you. He promised never to leave you nor forsake you and he never lies. Number five, the challenges you face won't be neutralized until you speak faith-filled words to defeat it. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you're born again, you are an extension of Jesus Christ on the earth. And that's why Christians are called the body of Christ. Yes, you are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And Christianity is not just a bunch of rules. It's, it's, it's a way of living like Jesus every day on the face of this earth. It's a way of living victoriously. Christianity is a way of living the more abundant life. Christianity is a way of living and reigning in life. If you believe that, say amen. Amen.